Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is some special topics and in this module we will have three lectures. The first one is interpretation of statutes. Now statutes are written laws that are passed by a legislature and in this lecture we are going to look at how do we interpret the statute. So basically if you have the text of a law how do you make sense out of it? If there is any ambiguity, how do you remove that ambiguity? That is, how do you interpret the law? What is written in front of you? Because when the legislature makes a law, it makes a statute, then you cannot go back to the legislators to ask if there is any confusion. But at the same time, you need to ensure that you are putting the text of the statute in the same way as the legislators themselves wanted. So this is what we are going to learn in this lecture, interpretation of statutes. Then, then we will have the law of torts. Now law of torts refers to certain tortuous liabilities that people have. And these are not direct liabilities, these are some sort of indirect liabilities. So this is what we will look at in the law of torts. And then we will have this act, the prevention of cruelty to animals act. Now we have put it in the special topics because although it is necessary for conservation, but at the same time it is also necessary for general management and in our day to day lives. So these three lectures will be dealt with in this particular module. So now let us start with the interpretation of statutes. A statute is a written law passed by a legislature. So it has to be in a written format. So all our laws, all our acts, all the rules that are passed, they all come in the category of the statute. So a written law and it must be passed by a legislature. And to interpret the laws, we have three classical rules. We have the literal rule which says that you should read the law as it is written. Then we have the golden rule which tries to overcome the limitations of the literal rule if something is not going right. And then we have the mischief rule in which case the courts look at what was the mischief or what was the lacuna in the law that the current law is trying to overcome. And by interpreting it in form of a remedy of the mischief or remedy of the lacuna, the way we interpret it is, is through the mischief rule. So let us begin with the literal rule and we are going to look at all these three rules through several case studies. So these rules have come up through several case laws in our country as well as in other countries. So when judges face this difficulty that there is a law in front of them, but there is certain things that are probably incorrect or certain things that could be uh, read in an ambiguous manner. So how do the courts or the judges decide about that? So this is the way through which we have reached these three laws. Now the first one is the literal rule. A statute must be given its plain and obvious meaning in the context of the act. So it basically says you have to read the law literally, whatever is written. And any word that is there in the law should be given its plain and obvious meaning, not a technical meaning, not a meaning that can uh, be confusing, but just its plain and obvious meaning. A good case law is the state of West Bengal and others versus Washi Ahmed, etc. on 7th of March 1977. Now, in this case, the context was 
that section 61 of the Bengal Finance Sales Tax Act 1941 exempted from tax liability vegetables green or dried commonly known as sabji, tarkari or shak when it is not sold in sealed containers. So basically it says that if you have a vegetable that is either a green vegetable or a dried vegetable which is commonly known as sabji, tarkari or saak, in that case the taxes will not apply if these vegetables are not sold in sealed containers. Now it so happened that the sales tax authorities levied sales tax on green ginger because in the view of the sales tax authorities green ginger is not a vegetable because you do not make curry or you do not make uh, normal vegetables with green ginger this is just an additive to the normal foods so they said the sales tax authorities said that green ginger will not get this exemption so it will have to be taxed so they said that green ginger sold by the respondents these are the respondents washi ahmed etc so this green ginger sold by the respondents taking the view that in as much as green ginger is used to add flavor and taste to food it is not vegetable commonly known as sabji tarkari or shak and this matter came to the supreme court of india after a while so in this case how did the supreme court decide whether green ginger is in this category or not because you can have both the views you can have the view that green ginger because it is a plant produce because it is normally eaten so you can count it as vegetable but you can also take the view that normally green ginger is not used to make any vegetables it is just an additive so this is a case in which the literal rule was made use of so a writ petition challenging the validity of the orders of assessment was allowed by the calcutta high court that is when we say the writ petition was allowed it means that the calcutta high court ruled in favor of washi ahmed so they said that washi ahmed is correct and green ginger is it comes in the category of uh, vegetable or shak or tarkari the calcutta high court held that green ginger is vegetable within the meaning of that expression as used in item 6 of the first statute now when the high court gave this judgment then the state of west bengal challenged this judgment in the supreme court so they went to the supreme court and in the supreme court what happened was the supreme court dismissed this appeal so if this appeal gets dismissed it means that the supreme court did not rule in favor of these people so they rule in favor of washi ahmed again so the supreme court held that green ginger is included within the meaning of the words vegetable in item 6 of schedule 1 and its sales are exempt from tax under section 6 of the bengal finance act and why so because the supreme court said that the word vegetable although it is not defined in the act but being a word of everyday use must be construed not in any technical sense nor from any botanical point of view but as understood in common parlance that is as it is understood literally that is denoting a class of vegetables which are grown in a kitchen garden or in a farm and are used for the table the word vegetable in item 6 of schedule 1 to the act so construed by giving its popular sense meaning that sense which people conversant with the subject matter with which the statute is dealing would attribute to that is what do normal people consider ginger, green ginger to be so if normal people the arm army of the land if they consider green ginger to be a vegetable then so it be so it denotes those classes of vegetables which are grown in a kitchen garden or in a farm and are used for the table green ginger obviously is a vegetable grown in a kitchen garden or in a farm and it is used for the table so this is what the honorable supreme court ruled it may not be used as a principal item of the meal so the 
state of west bengal was challenging it by saying that it is not used as a principal item of the meal but the honorable supreme court said that although it is not used as a principal item of the meal but it certainly forms part of the meal as a subsidiary item and green ginger is generally regarded as included within the meaning of the word vegetable as understood in common parlance so literal rule is just saying that you have to give any word its plain and obvious meaning away from the technicalities away from the scientific point of view another good example is when we talk about things like tomatoes now tomato is used as a vegetable but tomato botanically speaking is a fruit so in this case as well if there is an act that talks about vegetables then we will include tomato in the vegetable we will not say that because botanically it's a fruit so it should be in the category of fruit and not in the category of vegetables so this is a very good example of the literal rule now to reach the decision the honorable supreme court also used the fact that the railway authorities also treated green ginger as vegetable for the purpose of railway tariff and charged for the carriage of green ginger at the reduced rate applicable to vegetables so in this case the supreme court is referring to the fact that the railways also consider green ginger as vegetables because of which they are uh, transporting it at the reduced rate so this is another precedent the corporation of calcutta included green ginger in the category of vegetables in the market bulletin published by it fortnightly showing the rates in the municipal market so not only are the railway authorities considering it to be a vegetable but the corporation of calcutta is also in considering it to be a vegetable because it is including green ginger in the market bulletin under the category of vegetables then the division bench of the high court held green ginger to fall within the words of the uh, within the meaning of the word sabji tarkari or saak now it was this de decision that was being challenged but this honorable supreme court said that we should certainly be very slow to disturb a meaning placed on these words in bengali language by two judges of the high court who may be reasonably expected to be quite conversant with that language so in this case the honorable supreme court is saying that people who are there in west bengal including the railway authorities including the calcutta corporation and including the high court judges if they consider green ginger to be a vegetable then we must not change this definition we are not going to get into technicalities but we are just going to say that because everybody in the common parlance is using green ginger as a vegetable so this is the plain and obvious meaning of this term green ginger so this is the literal rule give all the words their plain and obvious meanings now in this case there are certain principles one principle is ejusdem generis ejusdem means same generis means kind so where a specific list of words is followed by a general word the general words will follow the same meaning because they are of the same kind what it is saying is where a specific list of words is followed by a general word for example if you have a list of words such as bicycle car jeep truck tempo and other vehicles if this is the statement that is given in a statute then because all of these vehicles are land vehicles whether it be bicycle car jeep truck or tempo so when when uh, in continuation when it says and other vehicles then these other vehicles by this rule would mean other vehicles that fly on the land it would not include things like aeroplanes or helicopters or ships or boats so that is the ejusdem generis rule when a specific list of words such as bicycle car jeep tempo truck is followed by a general word such as and other vehicles so vehicle is a general word so the general word will follow the same meaning as was there with these previous words the second rule is 
expressio unius, unius is exclusio alterius. That is expression of one is exclusion of others. The mention of one thing excludes all others. Where there is a list of words, the act applies to these words only. That is, if the list only comprised of bus, car and truck. So, in that case, the mention of these three words, bus, car and truck would mean exclusion of everything else. That is, it would not include anything else such as a bicycle or a bullock cart. You cannot expand these things because the expression of one or a few set of words leads to the exclusion of everything else unless it is provided in the statute itself. So, if it says bus, car, jeep and others, then you can include others. But if it just says bus, car and jeep, then it would exclude everything else. The third rule is nociter a sources. That is, a word is known by the company it keeps. The context is important. So, if there is any context in which a particular word is being used, then you are going to give it the same meaning as would be there in that particular context. Now, the literal rule has several benefits. It allows for quick decision making because there is nothing large to interpret. It respects parliamentary supremacy because it says that judges do not make law. We have seen before that the government comprises of three different organs. You have the legislature that makes the laws, you have the executive that executes these laws and you have the judiciary that adjudicates any disputes. Now, in this particular case, what the benefit of literal rule is that the judges do not make the laws. They are just interpreting the laws. They are not giving their own meanings. It upholds the separation of powers. There is no scope for prejudice of judge and it encourages precision in drafting because when the legislature knows that if it writes anything incorrectly, then the incorrect meaning itself would be uh, taken to be the correct meaning. So, in that case, the legislature will be more careful when drafting the acts or the statutes. So, these are the five benefits of the literal rule. Now, literal rule also has undergone certain modifications such as in the case of tax statutes, wherever two constructions are possible, the one in the favor of the citizen is to be followed. So, if in doubt, if you have two constructions, you are going to prefer the one that is favoring the citizens. But then the literal rule also has several shortcomings because it can lead to a bad or an unwise decision. Because even though everybody knows that something is wrongly written, but the literal rule would say that judges are not going to make their own laws, judges are only going to follow what is written in the statute, even if leads to a bad or an unwise decision. The mistakes that are done by the legislature or the parliament, they get highlighted, impacting the, the esteem of the parliament. So, basically, if a judge gives a ruling just literally following what is written in the statute, then in the on the very next day, the newspaper was, would start to highlight that the parliament wrote it in such a clumsy manner and that is going to uh, impact the esteem of the parliament. So, this is a drawback of the literal rule. Mistakes, even minor or typographic mistakes cannot be rectified because you have no scope. There is no scope for the wisdom of the judge. It may result in absurd rulings and we are going to look at a few examples now. And it also gives parliament the right to make absurd laws because whatever they make is the law. A good example of an absurd ruling is this case of Chung Fook versus White 1924. Now, it so happened that Chung Fook, now, now this case is from the US Supreme Court. Now, Chung Fook was a native born citizen of the United States. 
it means that Chung Fook was born in the United States. He it, it was not the case that he was born somewhere else. He had some other citizenship and then he became a naturalized citizen. No, he was a native born citizen of the United States. Li Shi, his wife, was an alien Chinese woman. That is, Chung Fook married a Chinese woman. Now, in 1922, she sought admission to the United States, but was refused and detained at the immigration station. A petition for writ of habeas corpus was denied. So, what happened was, there is a natural born citizen who married a Chinese woman. And now, that Chinese woman is trying to get into the United States, but she was refused the entry and she was detained. And when there was a petition for a writ of habeas corpus, that is, we must have the body, we must have this woman in the court or uh, with us, then this petition was also denied. And why was it denied? Because section 22 of the Immigration Act 1917, it reads like this, that whenever an alien shall have been naturalized or shall have taken up his permanent residence in this country and thereafter shall send for his wife or minor children to join him, and said wife or any of said minor children shall be found to be affected with any contagious disorder, such wife or minor children shall be held. So, what it is saying is, if there is a naturalized citizen, that is not a native born citizen, but if there is a naturalized citizen and he is asking his wife and minor children to join him in the United States. They, and if it turns out that any of these have any diseases that can be contagious, then these, uh, then the wife and the children will be held. That is, they will be detained. And then they will be detained till the time that this disease gets sorted out. But then the, it says, provided that if the person sending for wife or minor children is naturalized, a wife to whom married or a minor child born subsequent to such husband or father's naturalization shall be admitted without detention or treatment in hospital. So, basically what this act is saying is, if there is a person who is a naturalized citizen, That is, this person earlier had some other national uh, citizenship, but is now a naturalized citizen of the United States. Now, there can be two categories. One, he has a wife before naturalization. Or he can have a wife after naturalization. Now, obviously, this person would want his wife to accompany him to the United States. And the law is saying that if the wife was before the naturalization, that is, the man married the woman before the man became a naturalized citizen of the United States, in that case, the wife shall be detained if she is suffering from a contagious disease. But if the wife was had after the naturalization, that is, once this person became a citizen of the United States, then he married this woman. In that case, she will not be detained. Right? So, this is the, uh, the proviso, provided that if the person sending for wife or minor children is already naturalized, a wife to whom married or a, or a minor child born subsequent to such husbands or fathers naturalization shall be admitted without detention for treatment in hospital. Now, in this case, the problem arised because Chung Fook was not a naturalized citizen. He was a native born citizen. Now, which of, which of these uh, scenarios is going to apply there? So, the answer is none of these, because here we are only talking about the naturalized citizens. But 
looking at the law because the law said that only in cases of situations where a person has naturalized and after becoming a naturalized citizen he has had wife and children only in those situations they will be allowed entry. So, this is where the immigration officials detained his wife because they said that this provisio or this exemption is only available to those wives and children that were had after a person became a naturalized citizen of the United States, not a native born citizen of the United States. And this matter went to the Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court held the measure of the exemption is plainly stated and in terms extends to the wife of a naturalized citizen only. So, it does not extend to a native born citizen, but it is argued that it cannot be supposed that Congress intended to accord to a naturalized citizen a right and preference beyond that enjoyed by a native born citizen. That is, in any case the Congress that is the parliament of the United States, it would not have thought that we are giving the naturalized citizen more rights over that of the native born citizens. And the court below thought that the exemption from detention was meant to relate only to a wife who by marriage had acquired her, her husband's citizenship and not to one who with notwithstanding she was married to a citizen remained an alien. But even though the situation exists, the Supreme Court said we are inclined to agree with this view, but in any event the statute plainly relates only to the wife or children of a naturalized citizen and we cannot interpolate the words native born citizen without usurping the legislative function. The words of the statute being clear if it unjustly discriminates against the native born citizen or is cruel and un inhuman in its results as forcefully contended, the remedy lies with the Congress and not with the courts. Their duty is simply to enforce the law as it is written, that is as per the, the literal rule, unless clearly unconstitutional. So, even though the court agreed that it is giving a very absurd ruling, but the court said that we are in no position to change the meaning of what has been written by the legislature. Another example is Whitley versus Chapel and this is uh, from the United Kingdom. Now, in this case, the section 3 of the Poor Law Amendment Act 1851 stated that any person who personates any person entitled to vote in an election, that is a person who is impersonating others and impersonating whom? A person who is entitled to vote in the election shall be imprisoned and for such and such period. That is it made it illegal to impersonate anybody who is entitled to vote. Now, in those days, there was not a universal adult franchise, that is not everybody had the right to vote, but only those people who were paying certain amounts of taxes or were holding certain properties, only they were entitled to vote. And this law stated that if there is a person A who is entitled to vote and there is a person B who is impersonating A. then this impersonation is a crime and B will then be imprisoned. But the word here is entitled to vote. Now, in this case what happened was that the appellant chapel had been charged with impersonating J Marston. Now, Marston was a person who was entitled to vote. Okay? So, Marston had indeed been entitled to vote since he was legally eligible as a rate payer on the rate book to vote in the election. But it so happened that one day before the election, Marston died. Now, in this case, although Chapel is impersonating Marston, but Marston was dead one day before the election. So, in this case, should Marston, 
uh, should chapel be held accountable or not? That is the question. Now, in this case, chapel was convicted of the offense, but then he appealed and he argued or his side argued that the legislature has not used expansive enough language to make the personation of a deceased person illegal. That is when the law states that only impersonating a person who is entitled to vote is a crime. So, if the person was dead before the election, so he was not entitled to vote because a dead person is not entitled to vote. And so, in this case, chapel should not be uh, suffering from any imprisonment. The terms a person entitled to vote may only imply without a predetermined interpretation, a person who is eligible to vote at the time of personation. In this situation, the judge claimed the offense has not been committed. In this case, Justice Hannan stated that stretching terms in the legislation to ensure justice in the present case would be incorrect as it would set a precedent that could have dangerous implications in other cases and justice hates concurred that is he also agreed. So, uh, in this case chapel was not found guilty since a dead man cannot vote chapel had not impersonated a person entitled to vote and so his conviction was quashed. So, you might think that this ruling is an absurd ruling because the person had did everything wrong that he could have done that is he was impersonating a person who was entitled to vote. Now, if that person died just one day before the election, the person who was doing the impersonation should not have been given any benefit of it. But in this case, following the literal rule, that benefit was given. So, this is an absurdity that is brought out if the judges only follow the literal rule. And so, we come to the golden rule. Lord. Vince Ladale in Gray versus Pearson stated, the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words is to be adhered to unless that would lead to some absurdity or some repugnance or inconsistency with the rest of the instrument, in which case the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words may be modified so as to avoid the absurdity and inconsistency, but no farther. So, the golden rule is trying to do a harmonious interpretation. So, it says that we are going to follow all the literal meanings till there is an absurdity. And if there is an absurdity, in that case, we are going to overrule the, the plain and obvious meanings of those words to ensure that no absurdity or no inconsistency remains. But for the rest of the words, we are going to leave them as such. So, that is the golden rule. A case law here is R v Allen that is the king or the queen versus Allen. Now, in this case section 57 of the offenses against the person act 1861 said that whosoever being married shall marry any other person during the life of the former husband or wife in, in that case there would be penal servitude that is the person would be jailed if he or she married while his or her former husband or wife were living. Now, in this case Allen had two wives. So, he married during a time when his former wife or existing wife was already living and Allen in the court of law his side uh, argued that Allen has not committed any crime because he has not married twice. Why? Because the law does not recognize the second marriage. The law only recognizes one marriage. There cannot be, be bigamy. So, in that case, Allen should not be prosecuted. So, even though Allen has undergone two marriages because the second marriage is null and void because it was bigamy. So, he should not be prosecuted under this section. So, under the literal rule bigamy is impossible since civil courts do not recognize the second marriage. And so, this created a loophole 
and to plug this loophole the court read marry as to go through a ceremony of marriage so the court say, said that whosoever being married shall go through a ceremony of marriage with any other person during the life of the former husband or wife shall be prosecuted or shall be punished so by interpreting marry as going through the ceremony of marriage the loophole was plugged and allen was convicted so this is an example of the golden rule another example is this uh, case of ray sigsworth from 1935 now in this case section 46 of the administration of estates act 1925 stated that if the intestate intestate is a person who has not made a will before he or she dies so if somebody dies without making a will and this person leaves issue leaves issue means has a son or daughter but no spouse or civil partner that is this person who has not made the will does not have a spouse that is husband or wife or a civil partner but has a son or daughter in that case the residuary estate of the intestate that is all the property of this person shall be held on the statutory trust for the issue of the intestate that is all the property shall go to the son or daughter if a person has not made a will and does not have a husband or wife that is living and does not have a civil partner that is living so all the property shall go to the son or daughter now in this case what happened was a son murdered his mother now this mother had not made a will and this guy did not have a father his father was also dead and so as per the act the mother's property because she did not make a will and because she did not have a spouse or a civil partner and because she had a son so all the property of the mother would have gone to the son but this is the same son who had married uh, who had murdered his mother now as per the act the mother's property would get vested to the son now in this case the court judged like this in my judgment the principle of public policy which precludes a murderer from claiming a benefit conferred on him by his victim's will precludes him from claiming a benefit conferred on him in case of his victim's intestacy by statute meaning that there is already a principle of public policy that if somebody has made a will to a person and this person murders the person who made the will then the murderer will not be able to claim the benefit that was conferred to him by the victim's will but the court said that we are going to expand it even to the cases where the victim has died without making a will the principle must be so far regarded in the construction of acts of parliament that general words which might include cases obnoxious to the principle must be read and construed as subject to it a person cannot bring an action based on his own wrong as to the doctrine of judicial precedent we fill in the gaps so in this case the court said that we are not going to look for a judicial precedent we'll just fill in the gaps or we are just going to fill up the loopholes and so the son was held entitled to nothing so this again is an example of the golden rule that we are going to follow all the literal words in their plain and obvious meanings till the point that there is an inconsistency or there is something that is absurd that is morally repugnant and in that case the court is going to reinterpret the words or expand the words so as to remove the absurdity another example is this case law adler versus george now in this case Section three of the Official Secrets Act, nineteen twenty, said that no person in the vicinity of any prohibited place shall do such and such things. No person in the vicinity. Vicinity means around the prohibited place. But in this case, Adler was not in the vicinity. He was inside the prohibited place. So inside the Markham Royal Air Force Station in Norfolk, 
what adler did was he did everything else but he said that i am not in the vicinity i am inside now in this case using the golden rule the court expanded the term vicinity to include being inside the place as well so the court said that if we literally used the the literal meanings then it would mean that a person who is right next to the prohibited place that is right next to the air force base and if if he did the same thing then he would be held responsible but a, a person right inside the air force base would not be held responsible so this creates an absurdity so the court said that no we are not going to allow this we are going to expand the meaning of vicinity to include whatever is inside the base as well so this is another case law now as before the golden rule has certain advantages and disadvantages the advantages are that the drafting errors in the statutes can be corrected immediately that is when this law was being made probably the legislature did not think that vicinity could be uh, be used as a loophole so this drafting error can be corrected by the court and it provides for a more coherent meaning it provides for a more common sense meaning but then it has certain disadvantages because judges can change the law by changing the meanings of the words in the statutes so basically one can also argue that the legislature only wanted vicinity the the legislature if it had wanted that inside the prohibited place these things should have remained then the legislature would have legislated in that manner but then the judges have overruled the legislature which is uh, abhorrent or an affront to the separation of powers so judges can change the law by changing the meaning of words in the statutes it interferes with the separation of powers it doesn't help when there is no absurdity in the statute because it says that till the point there is an is an absurdity we are going to follow the words literally but then who is going to tell what is an absurdity there is no test that exists to determine if there is an absurdity that is one judge might think or might consider that saying the word vicinity has led to an absurdity but another judge seeing the same sentence could say that okay there is no absurdity this person was not in the vicinity and so he should not be punished and there is no test that can tell us whether judge 1 is correct or judge 2 is correct so that is a disadvantage of the golden rule next we have the mischief rule the mischief rule gives a judge more discretion than either the literal or the golden rule the rule requires the court to look at what the law was before the statute was passed in order to discover what gap or mischief the statute was intended to cover so the court is going to look at what was the situation before this law was passed what was the lacuna what was the gap or the mischief that this statute wanted to overcome and the court is then required to interpret the statute in such a way as to ensure that the gap is covered and this rule was first inundated in hayden's case so this is the most classical case this is from 1584 what is this case by the suppression of religious houses act 1535 the lesser monasteries in england they were dissolved and their assets were transferred to the king this is what the law stated now this is a bit archaic english so uh, it says and that also his highness shall have to him and to his heirs all and singular such monasteries abbeys and priories which at any time within one year next before the making of this act have been suppressed or dissolved so essentially the king is taking over all the properties in these monasteries abbeys and priories now in this particular case ottery college gave tenancy in a manor so manor is a property and ottery college which was a small uh, monastery it gave tenancy in a property to a person called ware and then leased the same parcel of land to this guy called hayden for 80 years in return for 
rents right before the passage of the act. That is what did Ottery College do? It had already uh, given tenancy of a piece of land to a person called Wares, but when they came to know that such an such act is going to be passed, they gave rights on the same piece of land to this person called Hayden for 80 years provided that he keeps on paying the rent. Now, in this case, should the land be bestowed to the king or should the land remain with Hayden is the question. Now, in this case, the court held that in this case, the common law was that religious and ecclesiastical, which means relating to the Christian church or its clergy, persons might have made leases for as many years as they pleased. And the mischief was that when they perceived their houses would be dissolved, they made long and unreasonable leases, like in this case for 80 years. Now, the statute of 31 H 8 does provide the remedy and principally for such religious and ecclesiastical houses, which should be dissolved after the act, as the said college in our case was that all leases of any land whereof any estate or interest for life or years was then in being should be void. And the reason was that it was not necessary for them to make a new lease. So, basically, Ottery College did not have any necessity to make this new lease for such a long period. As a former had continuance, that is, where already had a continuance on this uh, piece of property, and therefore the intent of the act was to avoid doubling of estates and to have but one single estate in being at the time, for doubling of estates implies in itself deceit. So, basically, the court is saying that the Ottery College themselves have done this fraud and private respect to prevent the intention of the parliament. And in this particular case, the judges also highlighted or underlined what the uh, mischief rule is. For the sure and true interpretation of all statutes in general, be they penal or beneficial, restrictive or enlarging of the common law, four things have to be discerned and considered. So, the judges should look at four things. One, what was the law before the making of the act? So, for any statute, you must see what was the condition before the act was made? What was the mischief and defect for which the common law did not provide? So, what were the loopholes? And by making this act, what was the remedy that the parliament has resolved and appointed to cure this particular disease or the loophole? And the true reason of the remedy. And then the office of all the judges is always to make such construction as shall suppress the mischief. So, the office of the judge is supposed to suppress this mischief as has had been desired by the legislature. And to advance the remedy and to suppress subtle inventions and evasions for the continuance of the mischief. That is, they, they are saying that the person who is suffering because of this act will in no way, uh, he will uh, he'll try to make some new inventions and evasions to continue his mischief for his own benefit. So, the role of the judge is to suppress these inventions and evasions and to act force and life to the cure and remedy according to the true intent of the makers of the act in the public good. So, in this case, the court held that the lease to Hayden was void. Another classic uh, case law here is Smith versus Hughes. Now, in this case, the Street Offences Act 1959 said that it shall be an offence for a common prostitute to loiter or solicit in a street or public place for the purpose of prostitution. That is what the law is saying that is that a prostitute will not go in the street or in a public place and advertise her services to gain customers. So, this is what the law is saying. It is an offense for a common prostitute to loiter that is wander around or solicit in a street or public place for the purpose of prostitution. But in this case, what the prostitutes did was they stood on their balcony or behind the windows of their house. 
so they were not in the street or in the public place they were standing on their balcony and they were behind the windows and they were soliciting people that were passing in the street by tapping on the balcony rail or window pane and attracting their attention and inviting them into the house now in this case should the prostitutes be prosecuted or not now if you went with the literal meaning it would say that because these prostitutes were neither on the street nor were they in the public place so in that case the uh, these prostitutes should not be prosecuted they should not be punished but in this case what the court did was that they said that uh, so in this case the uh, on behalf of the prosecutor it said that the soliciting had taken place in the street within the meaning of this section so does the balcony that is right next to the street does it count inside or not now in this case lord parker said that no he was the the chief justice he said that the defendants in each case were not themselves physically in the street but were in a house adjoining the street in one case the defendant was on the balcony and she attracted the attention of men in the street by tapping and calling down to them in other cases the defendants were on the ground floor windows either closed or half open and in other the case in a first floor window now the sole question here is whether in those circumstances each defendant was soliciting in a street or a public place now in this case they uh, they uh, interpreted the words as this observe that it does not say specifically that the person who is doing the soliciting must be in the street equally it does not say that it is enough if the person who receives the solicitation or to whom it is addressed is in the street so for my part i approach the matter by considering what is the mischief aimed by at by this act everybody knows that this was an act intended to clean up the streets to enable people to walk along the streets without being molested or solicited by common prostitutes so this was just a way to enable people to walk on the streets without getting molested uh, molested or solicited or harassed by common prostitutes viewed in that way it can matter little whether the prostitute is soliciting while in the street or is standing in a doorway or on a balcony or at a window or whether the window is shut or open or half open and in each case her solicitation is projected to and addressed to somebody walking in the street for my part i am content to base my decision on that ground and that ground alone so basically the judge is saying that the act was made to cover this loophole to cover this mischief and people have come up with a loophole and so we are going to plug this loophole by going back to the law by looking at what was the mischief that this law was trying to avoid and we are going to use that meaning so this is the mischief rule another example is this case law of corkery versus carpenter now in this case section 12 of the licensing act 1872 said that every person who is drunk while in charge on any highway or other public place of any carriage horse cattle or steam engine so basically any person who is drunk and is on a highway or a public place and is using any carriage horse cattle or steam engine then such and such penalty would be there now in this case the defendant was accused of being drunk in charge of a carriage when in fact he was riding a bicycle now this act if you go with the literal meaning it says carriage horse cattle or steam engine it does not mention bicycles but here you have a person who is drunk and riding a bicycle in a public place so what do you do so in this case the court ruled like this for this purpose there cannot be any distinction between a section in a highway statute passed for the protection of the public and a section in the licensing statute passed for the same purpose both of them concerning the conduct of a person on a highway and the preservation of public order and so a bicycle is a carriage this is what the court ruled it is a carriage in my opinion because it carries so the judges have expanded this act to plug this mischief 
the mischief that the act aimed to prevent was the danger to public because of someone driving a form of transportation on a public highway in a drunken state. So, it is immaterial whether it was a bicycle or certain other form of transportation. Thus, even though the act does not mention bicycles, it was expanded and the user was held guilty. Now, there are several advantages and disadvantages of the mischief rule. It gives most discretion to the judges, it can help resolve ambiguous situations. But then as before, this permits judges to change the law. In this case, the law did not say bicycle and the judge by ruling that a bicycle is a carriage has changed the law. So, it interferes with the separation of powers and views and prejudices of judges can influence the final decision. So, these are the three rules of statutory interpretation. Now, to aid the interpretation of statutes, we also make of certain make use of certain other tools and these are those tools or the aids to interpretation. There are several intrinsic aids that are inside the statute and there are several extrinsic aids that are outside the statute. Intrinsic aid includes things like long title, short title, preamble, definitions, headings, schedules and marginal notes. Now, we have seen before that when we were uh, looking at the IPC, we looked at all of these. We said what does the preamble say? Why was this uh, law enacted? How are the chapters organized? What are the definitions of words? What are the kinds of headings that people have used? when they were writing this law. All of these are written inside the IPC and so they are the intrinsic aids. But along with intrinsic aids, we also have extrinsic aids that are outside the statute. Previous acts of the parliament on the same topic, earlier case laws, dictionaries of the time, the historical settings. So, basically what did these words mean when the act was written? official report of what was said during the parliamentary debates. For example, in our country to interpret the constitution, the courts also make use of the constituent assembly debates. So, if there is a particular article that can be read in two ways, the courts go back to the constituent assembly debates and then try to understand what the legislators wanted to mean when they wrote these particular words. Similarly, for any act, you can make use of the official report of what was said during the parliamentary debates. We also make use of international conventions on this topic and the regulations and directives of the time. So, to sum it up, when you have a statute and a statute is a written law that is made by a legislature, there can be words that can have double meanings or ambiguous meanings or can lead to loopholes. So, the courts need to interpret these statutes and to interpret the statutes, there are three basic rules. You have the literal rule that gives the plain and obvious meaning, you have the golden rule that tries to overcome the absurdity and you have the mischief rule where the courts try to understand what was the mischief or what was the loophole that this act was trying to overcome and then interpret the words in those manner. At the same time, we also look at intrinsic aids and extrinsic aids to interpretation. Intrinsic aids are those that are written in the statute such as preamble, headings, marginal notes and so on and extrinsic notes are also an aid to interpret such as things like dictionaries or historical settings or historical laws or parliamentary debates and so on. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind. Thank you.